Today, I want to talk to you about how we can actually slow and inhibit the hallmarks of aging using autophagy. So here is that slide that you saw Ollie put up earlier today. And just so that we can recap what the nine hallmarks are, I'm going to go quickly through them for those who weren't at his presentation earlier. Um, these all represent the pathways down which we age. So the first is DNA damage. And as you can see from this broken double helix, the rungs are broken, the ladder itself is broken. Definitely not a good thing. And you can see where aging would come from there. Telomere erosion, these are the end caps of our chromosomes. And this has to do with how many times our cells can replicate. So many of you might know that tortoises are especially long-lived mammals. They live, for a, they live for over 100 years, and their cells can replicate 110 times in their cell lifetime. Whereas humans, at the age of 30, our cells can only replicate 70 times. At the age of 80, only 50 times. So you can see the variation between different species of animals. Um, that amount of times that our cells can replicate is known as the Hayflick limit. And what scientists really want to do now is push the Hayflick limit for humans so that our cells can replicate for longer and telomere attrition and targeting that is part of the key. Epigenetic changes, I think we all know what these are. So this would be things like smoking, drinking, drug use, too much stress, not enough sleep, not enough exercise. These are things that turn our genes on and off in ways that lead to suboptimal cellular function. But conversely, if we do the right things, we can have them be optimized. Impaired proteostasis, this just means impaired protein folding. So inside our, uh, of all of our cells, we have a number of proteins that do various things, and they need to be folded perfectly. Um, this is a bit like, uh, like folding the Marie Kondo way. And here is mitochondrial dysfunction, another hallmark of aging. And you can see where actually the mitochondria is splitting apart in this particular image. Our mitochondria are the powerhouses of our cell. So if you happen to feel very low energy, it's possible your mitochondria look like this. Altered nutrient sensing, I apologize for this particular photo, but I did want to show it because most of us associate altered nutrient sensing with insulin resistance, and that is a very good example of it. But this is an example of two neurons that are trying to sense nutrients as well. Some of you may know that with Alzheimer's disease, it's not possible for some of our neurons to actually sense glucose anymore because there actually is a biofilm over the receptor blocking the entry of glucose into the cell. That's where ketones come into play. But I did want to show you this. Another example of impaired nutrient sensing would be something called ferritinophagy, more likely to occur with women who experience anemia but have high ferritin levels, but they're not able to release iron into their bloodstream. And for this, you would need something called ferritinophagy to release it so that the person has the energy they need. Stem cell dysfunction, I don't need to tell you about this. We all want shiny, happy stem cells to repair and rejuvenate our wounds. And impaired intercellular communication. This is something that is, in particular, um, very close to my heart as an autoimmune patient. So um, when I was diagnosed with lupus and rheumatoid arthritis at the age of 39, I was told that I had sky-high cytokine and tumor necrosis factor alpha. Anything with the word necrosis in it is a bad thing. And uh, this is what was actually happening. My cells were misfiring and telling, sending out signals saying that I needed to produce more cytokines, more inflammatory uh, TNF-alpha. And you, you don't want that. You want it to be properly regulated. Finally, we have cell senescence. And senescent cells, which are the ones on the right, the green, uh, the green ones on the right, these are cells who have already reached their Hayflick limit. They have stopped replicating, and the body says, you should not replicate anymore because you will become a tumor. Unfortunately, they don't 
just disappear, but they hang around and they continue to secrete a cytokine. Well, they secrete something known as SASP,、uh, and SASP will secrete cytokines, which is what will you will then get low-level chronic inflammation to the other cells nearby. So those things are all quite bad, but we can actually hack them, and we can hack them with autophagy. So, what is autophagy?、Uh, those of you who know Greek will know that it comes from the word self and eating, but it's not self cannibalization at all. It is basically your internal QC program, so housekeeping, if you will. And I mentioned Marie Kondo earlier. What it is for me, it's like having billions of tiny Marie Kondos in your cells with Post-it notes going around saying, "Misfolded protein that needs to be thrown out. This is a damaged organelle that goes to the Salvation Army." And she's basically there keeping your cells young and clean by tossing out the rubbish. Now there's another Japanese connection, and it's with this man,、uh, cell biologist Yoshinori Osumi. Who was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2016 for his discovery of the mechanism of action of autophagy? So, how does autophagy work? Now, when Tamu first asked me to do this, he said this is going to be like a rock concert, so you have to have really good slides. And I thought, all right, this is a slide I definitely want to have up. It's one of my favorites, and what you will see is the entire process of autophagy. On the upper left-hand side, you will see the contents in the cytoplasm. So things like misfolded proteins, damaged organelles,、um, mitochondria, and then you see something that looks like the letter C. That's actually a double membrane structure, and as it engulfs or sequesters the contents of the cell, it turns from a phagophore into an autophagosome. You don't need to remember this, but what's really important is the little re-、uh, orange dot that is at the bottom, and that dot is called a lysosome. And lysosomes have enzymes which will degrade or burn up. All of this old cellular waste—it's very important. And if we don't have it, it can lead to things called lysosomal storage disorders,、uh, essentially where a lot of trash is bagged up, but it doesn't get taken out and/or burned up. And then you can see at the very end of the cycle, you can see that there is a bit of dust that is sort of left over. Those would be parts that have been salvaged to be made part of new cells. And in the process of doing that, a lot of energy is actually burned up. That's why when you go into ketosis or when you fast, the body doesn't have any fuel. In its wisdom, it says, "Right, I have a lot of dead wood around. In other words, dead cellular parts. Why don't I burn these as well to regain energy?" So, if you leave this presentation with one thought, it should be this one. And the reason why is that it is not because you get old that autophagy stops working. It is rather that when autophagy stops working, you get old. And why this is important is because if your autophagy or your autophagic mechanism is not working properly, you can hack it to repair it, bring it back into balance, and you can rejuvenate yourself. I was given five years to live at the age of 39. I did various other interventions. It is possible to stop diagnoses where you are told you have just a few years left to live, but the mechanism is extremely complex, and that's why if there is just one missing piece, for instance, the lysosome that I showed you in the earlier picture, you know the little orange ball, if just one piece is missing, then it's a problem for the entire、uh, apparatus to work. So let's take a look at how autophagy actually impacts all nine of the hallmarks of aging. And one thing to bear in mind is: don't look at 
a hallmark in a silo, but look at all of these holistically as part of a greater system. There is crosstalk between the hallmarks, for instance, between impaired proteostasis or impaired protein folding and mitochondrial dysfunction, for instance. That means that it is possible to make a change in one of the hallmarks and get a benefit in another. So, for instance, if we look at something like uh, proteostasis, which I talked about, that's the misfolded proteins, you can see quality control is very important, but if you fix that, you then have the opportunity to improve your mitochondria. The other thing is with regard to senescence and SASP. I mentioned that SASP is a chemical uh, which actually secretes cytokines. If you can limit that, you also have an opportunity to improve cell communication because you're not overexpressing these inflammatory cytokines which prematurely age you on the inside, but which also give you the outward signs of aging, such as wrinkles, which I don't think any of us want. So, what can we do to move the needle on autophagy? I know that Ollie spoke earlier today about lifestyle habits, and you can see on the right-hand side of this slide that things like optimizing sleep, uh, caloric restriction, intermittent fasting, uh, exercise, all of these things can move the needle on autophagy. But what if you're a woman? turns out that women and men respond differently to fasting. If you are a woman of reproductive age and you fast a lot, guess what? You're going to lose your menstrual cycle because the body in its infinite wisdom says this is a time of famine and it's not a good time to bring a baby onto the planet. If you are a hypothyroid patient, and women tend to be more likely to be hypothyroid patients, and you go into a fasted state for too long, what happens is the body says again, this is a state of famine, and I need to downregulate metabolism, which then makes it difficult for you to shift weight. So instead of using a, uh, an intervention, a lifestyle intervention such as fasting, I really wanted to focus on geroprotectors. These are things which will trigger autophagy, but don't actually involve fasting, uh, and are particularly relevant, in my opinion, to women. So on the left-hand corner, you will see these geroprotectors that, uh, that will induce, for instance, macroautophagy, uh, chaperone-mediated autophagy, uh, mitophagy, many of the ophagies. And at the top, you'll see four that are pretty well-known, rapamycin, metformin, spermidine, and resveratrol. I believe that Ollie has already spoken a bit about resveratrol. It's a bit controversial because some studies, or a study at least, has come out showing that it might be negative for health. In addition, there is a question about what the optimum dose for health would be, and it seems like it would have to be extremely high, much higher than what is available on the market right now. So I'm putting, I'm putting, uh, I'm going to put resveratrol to the side. Then we have metformin, which near Barzillay is studying at Albert Einstein College. So metformin and rapamycin are two of the geroprotectors that are going through human clinical trials right now. But there was recently a Danish, uh, a large cohort Danish study on men of reproductive age who took metformin. Those who had male offspring had a 40% increased incidence of penile defects in their male offspring. When the body actually has issues producing reproductive machinery, something has gone very, very wrong in the system, which is why I am a bit apprehensive about metformin, especially in younger people who are not diabetic. Uh, then we have spermidine. And as uh, Edward DeVille kindly said, I do know quite a bit about spermidine. It is something that was mentioned in the ancient tantric practices in Asia, so I do know about 
that from years ago, how it was meant for the emperors to use practices such as seminal retention in order to enhance their longevity. And Professor Dennis Noble, who's an emeritus professor of physiology at Oxford University, he and I believe that this is most likely due to the fact that the emperor or the man would be elevating his spermidine levels and retaining that for longevity purposes. But spermidine occurs naturally. It's not just something that men can do or produce in spite of the name. It's actually in every one of us in this room today. All children, all men, all women, all animals, all plants manufacture spermidine. We manufacture it in our tissues, uh, in our gut biome, and of course, we get it from our food. The only problem is that as we get older, we need to take more in. Now, the healthy centenarians, I believe Sean Wells said this, the healthy centenarians uh, around the world, especially in the longevity blue zones, have extremely high levels of spermidine. As a matter of fact, their spermidine levels at the ages of 90 and 100 are similar to those of individuals who are around 50 years old. Those people who are between 60 and 80 who tend to be unhealthy and getting ready to die, their spermidine levels are quite low. So if you can make it to 90, probably your spermidine levels are okay. But we do have a hack for increasing spermidine, and that would be by supplementing. And we can get it in things like mature cheeses, we can get it in any kind of an endosperm, uh, so it is, it, you can get it from wheat germ, you can get it from fermented soy in Japan. It's in something called natto, which is not very pleasant for Westerners to eat, but is very health-giving. And what's also interesting about spermidine is that it will target those autophagy elements that scientists are also looking to control to expand lifespan. So if you look at Becklin, you see on the chart, it will say uh, Becklin-1 peptide and the compound C1, which is known as TFEB. These two things are things that spermidine can actually upregulate, but they are individually on their own things, which scientists are looking to activate. But we can already do it with spermidine, which is one of the reasons that I like it so much. So let's take a closer look at how spermidine stacks up against the other gero protectors when we compare them on the hallmarks of aging. So this very nice slide was done by two University College London professors, Linda Partridge and Matthias Fuente Alba, and by National University of Singapore professor Brian Kennedy. And they put the, uh, the pharmaceutical targets for anti-aging on the left-hand side, and then the nine hallmarks of aging across the top. Um, as you can see, spermidine and rapamycin stack up very nicely. And this is where I think, as a patient who was given huge boxes of syringes full of immune suppressants, uh, when I was diagnosed with my illnesses at age 39, I look at rapamycin and I just think, I'm not going to take an immune suppressant, which is actually used for transplant patients, to keep their immune system so low that they don't reject their donor organs. I would rather go with something natural, which is then spermidine. So there are many different ways that you can get spermidine. You could get a synthetic, or you could get it from nature. My preference is from nature, and the reason why is because molecules, chemical or synthetic spermidine, is a molecular mimic of natural spermidine. So on a two-dimensional two basis, it looks exactly the same. Just like these two hands look the same, they're mimics and they meet up perfectly. But actually, if I stack them on top of each other, you can see that they don't meet up perfectly. It's like taking a left-handed glove and putting it on your right hand. But if you get these molecules from nature, they're not only what the body understands, because we've been living with these foods and plants for millennia, but they're also, they also come together with other cofactors, coenzymes. In the case of spermidine, these would be the precursor polyamines, putrescine, and spermine. I'm very sorry for the names, they are not very appealing. <laughs> So, um, there you have it. Those are some of the ways that you can hack the hallmarks of aging. And as I close, I would just like to show you this illustration, which I'm sure all of you have seen before, done by the Japanese printmaker Hokusai. Uh, he did this in his eighth decade. And 
what I would like to uh, impress upon you is that we all have a bright future ahead of us if we simply learn to use the body's innate wisdom, which is autophagy, and leverage it to slow down or inhibit those hallmarks of aging, we can all live to 100 or even older in vitality and perfect health. Thank you very much.